In this video, we're going to cover an alternate way to treat an anterior canalothiasis, and it's with a technique called the deep head hanging maneuver. But before we get into that, let's review how you would know when to even use a deep head hanging maneuver. Suppose you have a patient whom you suspect has BPPV based on subjective reports of dizziness and a visual change that the room is spinning. So you perform the Dix Hole Pike maneuver and it's positive, which means that it reproduced vertical nystagmus. Now remember, vertical nystagmus can either be up or down beating. If it's up beating, that implicates the posterior semicircular canal. If the vertical nystagmus is down beating, that implicates the anterior or superior semicircular canal. And in addition to looking at the direction of the nystagmus, you're also going to look at the duration of the nystagmus. Now coming over here, which we looked at in the previous video, in general, if the nystagmus lasts less than 60 seconds, you have a canalothiasis of the affected canal and you perform an Epley maneuver. This is one of the canalith repositioning maneuvers. If the nystagmus lasts longer than 60 seconds, then you have a cupulolithiasis of the affected canal, and you use a liberatory maneuver. This one is the Seamont liberatory maneuver. So, an anterior canalothiasis can be treated with an Epley maneuver. However, you could also treat an anterior canalothiasis with a deep head hanging maneuver. So to perform the deep head hanging maneuver, the patient's going to start in long sitting, as you see right here, with the neck neutral in all planes. This is position one. Now again, before we go to position two, notice that I'm supporting her head and her neck just below the occiput. This is important for a couple of reasons. One is so the patient feels safe because as you recline them into supine, their head is going to be hanging over the edge of the table, and you want the head supported. The other reason is so you can accurately position them into the appropriate amount of cervical extension in position two. So that being said, let's move into position two. So with the head and the neck supported like you see here, we're going to recline the patient into supine, allowing their head to hang as far as possible over the edge of the bed, which is going to amount to around 45 to 60 degrees of cervical extension. This is position two and our first stopping point of the deep head hanging maneuver. At the stopping point, we're either going to wait a total of one to two minutes or around 45 seconds after the symptoms stop. And the symptoms can be dizziness, they could be nausea. If we're looking at nystagmus, we can use that as a gauge. But we want to allow 45 seconds at least after those symptoms stop before transitioning into the next position. So again, what you see right here is position two. Now to transition into position three, the patient's still going to be in supine. That's not going to change, but we're going to move their neck from cervical extension into about 45 degrees of cervical flexion. And once here, we're going to have another stopping point, either one to two minutes total or 45 seconds after the symptoms stop. Once we've waited the appropriate amount of time in position three, the patient is then allowed to sit back up into long sitting, and then their neck is allowed to move back to neutral. This is position four, and it's actually exactly the same as position one. This completes the deep head hanging maneuver. Hopefully this video gave you a good understanding about how and when to perform the deep head hanging maneuver. In the next video, we're going to transition to talking about cupula lithiases of the posterior and anterior canal. So we'll see how to use the Seamont liberatory maneuver.